Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is a place for having the right answer. Take learning the alphabet. There is really only one correct way to say the alphabet, and we probably all learned it the same way through a song, right? Now, I suppose you could learn the letters randomly. It might be quite a challenge to do. But it'd be really hard to look anything up, wouldn't it? So we assume that everybody knows the alphabet in the exact same way. Well, Linda and I were, were just in Mexico, and I had a funny interaction involving the alphabet. We were arriving at, our, at the resort we were staying at, and our luggage was being accounted for to be delivered to our room. And the bellhop asked me my name. So I said my name, and he got the Jeff part, fine. Usually Spanish speakers say, oh, it's like jefe, which, by the way, means boss. And sometimes after that, they call me boss. But he could not get the last name. I don't know why, but Silvernail did not translate into anything that he could write down. I said it like three times, and it just, I wasn't getting anywhere. And Linda says, oh, just, just spell a form in Spanish. So, <laughs> I know a little bit of Spanish. <laughs> but I never learned the alphabet in Spanish. <laughs> so I'm racking my brains. Oh, how do I do this? Uh, ese... E, L, A, I got the V, and I, I didn't have a clue what V was. <laughs> I go, give me the paper, I'll write it for you. <laughs> the right answer also has a rule. When we first start learning arithmetic, 2 plus 2 equals 4, right? No problems with that. You get the multiplication, it gets a little more complicated. Now, it wasn't complicated when I grew up. If you're my age... How did we learn multiplication? You had flashcards. It was like 7 times 6 is 42. 6 times 7 is 42. It doesn't matter why it's 42. It doesn't matter how it works out the 42. We just put it in our brains. It's still there. I am told that's not how it works nowadays. That you actually, students actually have to learn why 7 times 6 equals 42. They have to learn how to get to that notion. They, in other words, they have to figure out what is the thought process that is behind that simple answer of 42? So it's more than just the right answer. It's knowing how to get there. And generally, I think you find as you get deeper and deeper into learning or growing in any subject, I, I find that there, the right answer is not always helpful because it tends to stifle us a bit. And I, it works that way in our faith as well. Sometimes I think the expectation for a right answer can actually hinder our faith. One of the ways I see this happen, folks get asked to be a Sunday school teacher. And the usual response is, I don't know enough to teach Sunday school. Well, when I hear that, I think, great, you are perfect for the job. <laughs> because I think cut and dried answers, they put an end to curiosity and growth and can stifle development. There's an old joke about someone giving a children's sermon. And the adult says, children, I'm thinking about something with a bushy tail that climbs trees. Does anyone know what I might be thinking about? And the kid's all, huh? <laughs> They're just staring blankly. So the adult says, okay, uh, it has a bushy tail, climbs trees, and it eats acorns. Anybody? Nothing. Okay, it has a bushy tail, climbs trees, eats acorns, is colored gray, and makes a chattering noise. Finally, one brave child says, It sounds like a squirrel, but I know the answer has to be Jesus. Thankfully, our deacons are a little better at children's sermons, so Jesus is only the answer half of the time. <laughs> in our history as Lutherans, in our tradition, we have had this long-term struggle with the role of the right answer. Think back to the 95 Theses. Fit on one piece of paper, right? And then we get to the small catechism, which is actually a series of questions and answers, a little tiny booklet. 
put it right in your shirt pocket. And then as uh, time went on, a little bit of time, they had to answer to the emperor what they believed. And so they came up with the Augsburg Confession, 28 answers, I guess, for everything that we believe. And that worked for a while. But then more, more issues came up, and there was a quest for more right answers. And so they came up with a book of Concord. I believe this is in the late 1500s. I could look it up, but I forgot to look it up. So here you have over 600 pages of now the right answers. And so you figure, okay, 600 pages, that should cover everything. No, it didn't work that way. wasn't enough for the Lutheran theologians of the time. And as the original generation of the Reformers had all died, then Lutheran theologians kept trying to come up with more right answers. And by 1622, they had published nine monumental volumes in Latin that defined the right answer to every possible theological question you can think of. And when they... I haven't seen these myself, but that when they say monumental, I'm thinking a lot bigger than this. So imagine nine volumes, probably twice that size, probably filled up a whole bookshelf. And so you think, if you're one of those theologians, okay, we put a lot of work into this. Our work is done. We can relax. But what happened historically in our tradition is the theology of the right answer had a very negative impact on Lutherans. It stifled the faith of the people. And that spirit that rose up and drove the Reformation was just quashed. It was quashed by this tyranny of the right answer. And a new movement and reaction rose up and restored the faith of the Reformation. It was called the Pietist Movement. And that was the movement that originally brought our Lutheran tradition to North America. Now, they had plenty of their own issues, so I'm not holding them up as always having the right answer, but at least for the time period, they had the spirit. And we are here at least in part because of what they did to spread the faith. I think questions are good. And I don't think it's necessary that we always agree on an answer. And as a spiritual leader... Sometimes I think the best response I can give to someone's question is, well, what do you think? And I think it's a perfectly good response. Some questions in our faith, by their very nature, I think have to stay open. Things like, why do bad things happen? People have been wrestling with that probably as long as people have been in existence on earth. And I don't think we're going to come up with an answer that's going to satisfy everyone in every circumstance. Or if you deal with science a lot, you may, you may wrestle with, well, what about science and faith? How do they, they complement? How do they contradict each other? What's the answer there? I don't think there necessarily is a right answer there. Maybe it's good that we they keep that question open. Or on a personal level, what does God want for my life? There may be different answers at different parts of our life. So it becomes really dangerous to say God specifically wants this. Well, maybe for that time, that's true. It may not always stay that way. And I think it's fine to have opinions on questions like this. That's wonderful. And I think it's really good if you listen to other people's opinions as well. And that interchange, I think, strengthens us. But when we start defining an answer, saying this is the answer, I start getting nervous. And when we start prescribing that answer as being the only right one and prescribing all answers, all other answers, saying they're wrong, that's when I want to start heading for the door. But I am going to make an exception this morning to my aversion to the right answer. And it comes from our gospel reading. Now I need to tell you a little bit about how John, the gospel of John is structured. It's a little different than the other gospels. And there's a definite pattern that occurs over and over again in the Gospel of John. It goes like this. Jesus does a miracle, or as John calls him, Jesus does a sign. It's usually something really good. But then, instead of people all rejoicing in this really good thing that happened, they start raising objections. And arguments come up from that. So let me give you an example. Um, Jesus meets this man who's been blind from birth 
Jesus gives him his sight. And he's an adult. This is a really amazing thing. You think everybody would rejoice over that. But the people who witnessed this sign, some of them start saying, oh, it's just a trick. That guy, it's not the same guy. He just looks like the guy who was blind. Or, oh, he really wasn't blind. He's been 30 years old. He's been faking it for 30 years, waiting for Jesus to come along. So, it's, no, it's just, it's just a trick. When they finally decided, well, maybe it is the same guy, but he received the sight, but it happened on the Sabbath, and that's against God's law to heal on the Sabbath, so, so therefore Jesus is a sinner, and you shouldn't pay any attention to him. Now, when that happens in the Gospel of John, you got the sign, you got the argument about it. The next thing that happens is Jesus has a teaching. He teaches the folks that were gathered a bunch of things, and they argue more, and there's even more disputes. And that pattern goes over and over again throughout the Gospel of John until you get to when Jesus raises Lazarus from death. At that point, the opponents can no longer contradict the sign they conspire to have Jesus killed. And in the Gospel of John, that's the reason Jesus is arrested and killed. Of course, God surprises everyone, right? Easter Sunday morning with the resurrection of Jesus. And now, as the Gospel goes on, Jesus is appearing to his disciples. Appearing to, as Eileen said, all except Judas, who's no longer with the disciples, and Thomas. Apparently, Thomas was out picking up the pizza and wings that evening. <laughs> Jesus drops in. Thomas is out. Naturally, he's a bit skeptical. And because of that, he's forever known as Doubting Thomas. You express one doubt, and forever you are labeled. <laughs> Not fair. No wonder kids in the old joke on children's sermons are afraid to answer squirrel. <laughs> but Jesus comes back next week. And Thomas is there. This time, I guess, the disciples opted for delivery rather than takeout. And Jesus says, come see my wounds. And what does Thomas say? My Lord and my God. Now, you can read the whole Gospel of John. And by the way, I think that's a great thing for you to do. Read the whole Gospel of John. But you can read the whole Gospel of John. And I don't think you're ever going to find a clearer expression of faith than you're going to see right there with Thomas saying, My Lord and my God. For John, that's the right answer. And just so we wouldn't miss it, two verses later, John writes this as the purpose of his entire gospel. This is the reason he wrote the gospel. He writes, These signs were written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The whole gospel, so that we would have the faith of Thomas and join him in proclaiming this of Jesus, my Lord and my God. And that's one answer that I hope we all can agree on. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.